Joining us under the gun is the man, the myth, the legend, the uh, the Helmuthian, Phil Helmuth. Uh, Phil, how are you, first off? I'm doing fabulous. I've got no complaints. You know, life's, life's amazing. I mean, it's been a little... Uh, a little frustrating. It seems like Daniel wants to take my legacy away from me. I've worked pretty hard to, you know, become the all-time bracelet winner. I've worked pretty hard to win all the tournaments all over the world that I've won. You know. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and uh, we'll we'll touch on that, of course. Uh, many reasons why I always want to have you on my podcast. Many of the reasons why I always want to talk to you. You know, it's funny. You, you and I, I feel like we've become friends through the years. Early on, when I first got into poker. I'm not going to lie. I thought you were an asshole. You know what I mean? I would see oh, your okay. antics at the table, and I was like, man, if he did something like that to my dad, I'd be so mad. But the older I get, the more I appreciate you, Phil. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think – well, I'm glad that's the case. You know, it feels to me like – it feels to me like, you know, in the poker world, you're in the poker world. You've been in the poker world a long time, like a long time. And you know that – you know, basically in our world, um, everybody likes me. Everybody knows I'm a nice guy. And so that's just a fact. And so, you know, it's very interesting, you know, that, uh, that you know, unfortunately had a bad rap. I, I just assumed when I started being the poker brat, what I assumed was this, that I would, you know, end up being the bad guy at poker. They kind of want to be the bad guy. And I just thought, I'm going to be the bad guy until everybody figures out I'm a nice guy. So, you know, I always thought by 2007, 2008 that I would be pretty loved in poker because I'm a good guy. I'm the guy I've never cheated on my wife. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. You know, I'm a pretty reasonable guy away from the table. And so I always thought that that would kind of pass, and it's taken a lot longer uh, to lose that reputation. And, uh, you know, that's okay, but it's still, you know... (laughs) I didn't dream I would be perceived this long by the public. But, I mean, they started seeing holes in this right away. I mean, you know, people came up to me in 7, 8, 9, 10. The last 15 years, people have come to me and they said, Phil, more people ask me questions about you than any other poker player. I've been hearing that for 15 years straight because there was a perception of Phil's a bad guy, but I think that the world kind of figured out I wasn't. Was it? Let me ask you. Okay, so we're going to get to this the Negreanu Helm Youth match, which of course has been rescheduled for the end of March due to a, a non-player COVID concern. Good to hear that you and Daniel are both okay. So we'll get to that in in a moment or two. While I have you here, let's go back to early on in your career. You know, was the poker brat persona? Was that you? Was that uh, a show? Was that some sort of mastermind marketing ploy, just knowing that, hey, somebody's got to be the villain, villain, why not me? No, I mean, that was just that was just me not handling, you know, losing well. And, uh, you know, I talk about it in my autobiography. Everybody that reads Poker Brat all of a sudden loves me because they see what I actually have to struggle with. They see that I grew up pretty normal. They see that I grew up with a low self-esteem. They're like, ah, that's why Phil is the way he is. Now, Poker Brat itself is something that I came up with along with Andy Glazer. Um, we just decided that we were going to, you know, that I was going to nick my, nickname myself Poker Brat. So I gave myself that nickname and, uh, and it stuck. And, you know, I just haven't always, you know, because of the way I was raised, you know, I was, I was you know, the oldest of five and I was under a lot of fire from my parents. My grades weren't good. I wasn't particularly athletic, you know. And so nothing that was kind of prized, I didn't play musical instruments, nothing that was prized by my parents was I good at and then developed a low self-esteem. And so that what I had to do is I had to beat my brothers and sisters in every game we played. And so I spent a lot of time learning games and, you know, I had the age advantage. And so when my brother and sister would actually beat me in a game, I'd go crazy if my brother rolled double sixes to beat me. I'd go crazy. I'd be like, what the, blah, 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 because it felt like I didn't have anything to live for. My grades were the worst of, of my clan, my athletic skills, you know. And so, you know, when I lost the poker, it, it was a self-esteem issue. And, you know, it's carried over, you know, I'm, I'm 56. I still have that issue, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to do the best I can. And, 
you know, and, and, and I think, you know, most of, most of the, most of the players in the world love it when I go off and, uh, and they have fun with it. And they're like, they text their friends, Phil went off at me and they consider it a badge of honor. I I don't want to be that way, but I have been that way my whole life. And I'm trying, trying to get better. Was there a point in your career where you kind of, I mean, I know you owned it. Obviously you, you, you and, and uh, Glazer came up with the nickname Poker Brat, so obviously you owned it. But at the same time, was there a point in your career where you were like, okay, you know what, this is, this is a good marketing thing. It's a way to kind of differentiate myself from the rest of the poker players out there. Maybe I can be the villain. Did you see it as kind of a you know, possible, just I'm, I'm going to keep this going because it can help me financially, it can help my popularity? Well, I mean, it was pretty telling when it was pretty telling when I still remember I was at Foxwoods and uh, and I ran into the world, some po- world poker tour people. And they said, don't change. Don't change a thing. Because I was compl- I was telling a man, I hate being this way. And they're like, don't change. Please don't change. And ESPN is like the ratings are unbelievable when you act like yourself, you know, don't change. So, so I started have, having television producers tell me. Basically, they wanted to me, me to be the poker brat. That still was not going to influence me enough to do it. I remember when I came in and one of those years, like 06 or 07, I was not a poker brat for like three weeks. Four weeks, I might have made it. Wait, a whole four weeks. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I made, might have made it four weeks. And then I started losing it. And of course, you know, everybody's like, yeah, that's just Phil. And I was like, wait, I was perfect for four weeks. That's not me. And so, yeah, I mean... You know, I mean, I think that, you know, the bad guys get a lot of press, right? And, you know, and uh, and so being poker brat probably, you know, enhanced my reputation. A lot of people didn't like me. Like you said, you didn't like me at first because I saw the way I acted. I didn't know and you. Said, I mean, in fairness, I didn't know you. I wasn't in the poker world yet. I only saw, you know, I only saw what... You know, back then, what, you know, Matt Moran's and that whole crew put together with the World Series of Poker and the WPT, and, and then obviously later on. So it was just what I saw, and I think that's what a lot of people, they, yeah, just, but they don't know you. They just see what they, you know, what's edited together and, you know, that exactly. persona put out there. Yeah, you and I are in complete, complete agreement here. Uh, without people knowing me, they think that I'm a jerk. Because they see me going off and being a poker brat. And they're like, this guy's an asshole. This guy doesn't handle himself well. This guy isn't classy. And they make all those snap judgments um, because, because I go, you know, kind of John McEnroe, poker brat in the moment. You know what I'm saying? And so that's kind of the way it is, you know. And so I had a lot of people out there that didn't know me, that didn't like me. So, you know, if you, but they all remembered me. So if you went around and you pooled the worldwide public, a lot of them thought I was a complete, you know, asshole. The worldwide public, mind you. And I just figured that that would all change quickly, and it didn't change. And so, you know, again, you know, I, I, the perception of Phil being a bad guy. And the funny thing is I'm actually the, the, probably the goodest of the good guys in the poker world. You know that, and the poker world knows that, but the, a lot of people listening to this podcast don't know that. Yeah, I mean, I guess, and that's kind of, it's funny when people ask me about you. They, so one of the biggest questions I always get, the most common question is, is it an act? Is Phil really like that? You know, and, and I say, I'm like, listen, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of having dinner with him a couple of times, and I've got to hang out with him. I did commentary with him, and, and you know, he's a very personable guy. Uh, as for, you know, is it an act at the table? I always say, I don't think it is. I don't know. You've got to ask him, which is why I was asking no, you. Bad. Yeah, I, I don't think it is. You're just you're just that competitive, right? I mean, which probably being that competitive, I imagine, is a curse and a blessing, right? It's driven you to who you are today, but at the same time, it causes you to lash out times. I mean, I, I think that it. I think it is. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's a blessing and a curse, but a lot of times the great ones are really driven, right? Uh, and. You know, you look at Michael Jordan, he just worked his ass off. You look at Tiger Woods, he worked really hard. You know, um, I have all the records in, in poker. Um, and so, and, and you know, I've just been super driven, right? Driven to keep going and going and going. And, uh, you know, whether or not someone like Negreanu 
whether or not he thinks I'm the best poker player in the world, he doesn't even think I'm close or not, he has to at least respect the fact that, you know, that I have a, the best tournament record on the planet in the last 25 years, the last 30 years, and it's not even close. And so, you know, I had a, one, of the, one of the young players, one of the young guns tell me, yeah, Phil, you're the greatest of all time tournament players. One of the very people who Daniel puts in front of me is like, yeah, of course you're the all time, you know, you're the greatest of you're the GOAT tournament player. And that's, that was a goal, and I've worked hard for that, you know. How much does it bother you to see your reputation from a poker playing perspective kind of tarnished. I remember back when I first started getting into poker, actually, professionally as a commentator and a broadcaster, I remember people talking about how, oh, you know, the game's passed Phil by. He'll never win another, like, you know, he'll never win another 10K or anything like that. And then, you know, that was before you won the World Series of Poker. What year Europe. Was that? I want to say that was probably like 09. You know? Yeah. That, I mean, that was like 08, 09. I was just doing live. I had finished live at the bike, and I had just gotten hired by Maury to cover the World Series of Poker Europe. And people were telling me that Phil Helmuth's the game had passed you by. That's that's exactly what they said in 09. And then you look at what happened in you know 12 and 13. I finished second in Player of the Year twice. I won three bracelets, you know, um, uh, uh, three seconds. And just tore everything apart. I put up so many points those years, it was crazy. Uh, Greg Merson had to win the main event to pass me for player of the year. And so I just tore the whole series apart. And all of a sudden, I was the greatest again. You know, So oh nine, 9 Phil is not going to win anything again. And then by, you know, by the end of 2012, I was the greatest. And by the end of 2013, I was the double greatest. And, you know, I mean, these things go in cycles and waves. You know, uh, last the last time we played in 2019, I had a second, a third, a fifth, and a sixth, you know. And so, you know, that's uh, pretty amazing. Um, I think I finished top ten again in the points. And uh, so I'm just down there, down there, down there. So I want the chance to compete. I'm not saying I'm the best. There's some people that have worked really hard at their no-limit hold'em games, you know. But I'm certainly one of the best all-around players in the world. And I may st- and I may well still be. I'm not saying I'm the greatest, but everybody thinks they're great at poker, right? And I have all the records. And so not that many people have, have the record that I have, even in the last five years. But, you know, uh, Negrani will tell you there's a bunch of players that are better than me. Um, and he might be right. I'm not saying I'm the greatest in the moment. I was the greatest in, you know, well, in, I don't think... in, in the 90s. And I was, the, let me finish. I was the no, greatest please, please. in, you know, oh, was the greatest in 2000 to 2005 when I tore the World Series apart. I was the greatest, you know, from 2009 to 2015. And so, you know, it's hard to always be the greatest. And so now if I, you know, and so maybe I'll, maybe I'll, you know, Negreanu says I have a bad record in the high rollers. But then when I text him, he admits that I'm up a million or 1.5 million. But publicly, he said... Phil is not. It's just a lie. He said Phil's a loser in the high rollers. I'm not a loser in the high rollers. It's not even close. I might even be up two million in the high rollers. So I mean, you know, it's really kind of, you know, kind of weird. I mean, I think I won in the cash games. I won 28 out of 30 times in televised cash games, and then going into the uh, you know high stakes poker where I just won a little bit over 10 sessions. You so know, what's um, so Phil? What's the issue then? So why why do? And by the way, I put a tweet out there, and I, I came out and I said, "Listen, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Phil Helmuth is the goat. I'm not going to tell you he's not. But I did point out one thing. I said, "Listen, when we're evaluating a goat of whatever sport or game or you know whatever we're we're trying to evaluate," I said. You know, we can't just look at the current day, right? I mean, I'm not, as a hockey fan, you know, Wayne Gretzky is certainly not as good as Connor McDavid right now. There's no chance. But, you know, we, we have to factor in what he did back in his era against the players in his era. So, you know, what you did, and my point was basically, I said, you know, what, how dominating Phil was in his era against the players of his era certainly has to factor into that. Why do you think... There well, it's is. Not just that. I mean, it's not just that. It's not being the greatest of all time. Isn't being about being the best today. It's you have to be there for at least twenty five years. You can't start talking greatest of all time in our profession without looking back at least twenty years, right? So ten years from now, 
They could say that, uh, you know, I mean, there's like two people that are in discussion for greatest of all time now, me and Doyle, you know. And uh, and I have the resume and everything. I've won probably $12 million, well, over $12 million playing in cash games. I've, I've All I've done is just crush, 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 right? And, uh, you know, there were a couple of years in 08, 9, 10 where I didn't do well in the televised cash games. And since then, I've just fucking crushed them and dominated them. And so, you know, I just keep putting up you know, greatest of all time numbers in every, and e- everywhere. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of, but you can't, the point is it has to be a timeline there. So in 10 years from now, maybe Phil Ivey will be the greatest of all time in 10 years from now, maybe Steven Shidwick, but right now, you know, you, 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 some of these guys you can't even talk about. They haven't been around long enough. Or I'll, I'll ask the you straight up. Then discussion. do you think, are you the greatest of all time? I mean, I, I mean, I think it's between Doyle and I right now, right? And then, you know, in, in, in five years or four years when Ivy enters the conversation, that's another conversation, right? Why do you think that among a certain group of players, why do you think that you are not respected? Uh, I mean, I think some of those, some of those guys are... Understand, listen... You want to be the goat in any sport, people take shots. Everybody takes shots, right? I mean, they make fun of Michael Jordan, the crying Jordan, all this bullshit. They take shots at you, right? But the younger players, especially, you know, they're going to take shots, right? And they're just like, and they want to chop you down at the knees and stand on your shoulders. That's what they want to do. Someone told me that 10 years ago, and I find that to be true. And so, you know, but, you know, you talk about some of the younger generation that, that has an amazing group of players that may be better at me in no limit hold'em tournaments right now. Um, maybe not at the World Series, but maybe in high rollers or there's you know, some amazing poker players out there that have won a lot of money. And they're kind of sick of, you know, Phil Helmuth getting all the press, taking all the oxygen out of the room. And, you know, and they want some respect. And I respect that. And I actually think. You know, I put a list out of like 20 guys that I actually think are great from the next generation and I'm giving them respect, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, and so, I mean, this is kind of a silly, I'm kind of done with it. I, I, the last tweet I put out a couple of days ago, I'm like, all right, I'm done with this. I mean, what do you want? You know, I mean, all I've done is wanted everything I've done, you know, at a world-class level. I'm kind of done with it. You know, I, mean, are I you? don't really want to be discussing this. Are, okay, but are you, though? Because, I mean, I, I know you. I know you, Phil, and I, I see the tweets, and, I mean, I know you've worked on your – I know you've worked on your mental game and, and, and just your mental well-being through the years. Uh, obviously, you've got a relationship with Tony Robbins. You put a book out called Positivity, yet when I see Daniel Negreanu – you know, taking the shots at you, when I see Justin Bonomo taking the shots at you, when I see other people out there kind of dismissing your, you know, your legacy, what have you, what you've done and, and all your achievements, I, I see it hurts you. I, I, I know it does, but of course it does. But all the, all the work that you've been able to do, like the positivity, the work you've done with Tony Robbins and everything like that, has that been able, why hasn't that been able to you just like, why can't you just blow it off? Or is it just too hard? Well, I mean, I, 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 tr- I told you one minute ago that I'm done with it. And I didn't mean forever. I'm, I'm obviously going to defend my legacy, but I'm kind of – there's been a Twitter war between Daniel and I, yeah. right? I mean, I wouldn't call it a war. It's him insulting me is what it is. And it's very one way. And, uh, and that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, both – there's a lot of people that are close to Daniel and I that actually think he's delusional. For some reason, he refuses to give me any credit or respect at all. It's crazy. And that's just the way he's going to be. You know, I mean, I, act, I honestly think that because I said something negative about the way he played Doug Polk, I didn't watch the match, but I got report, a lot of reports from Mike. Because I sub- said something negative, I think that's the reason he just attacked my whole – I actually think that. I think that, you know, he's the kind of guy that if you, if you hit him with uh, – you know, with the tip of your finger, he's going to try to fucking kill you, you know? I mean, and that's just, you know, Daniel can be a little bit uh, sensitive and a little bit violent, you know? And that's him. And so I just get kind of sick of, you know, the lies aren't good, right? And I mean, can you imagine what I could come back at him with? I mean, my God, I was telling my friends, can you imagine what I could say? I mean, it's just, you know, but I don't say a word, you know? What could you say? 
<laughs> well, I mean, I'm gonna hang up on this interview if you ask. No, that come again. on, don't hang up, don't hang up, don't go anywhere. I mean, I mean, listen, you, don't you, don't fake me. That's not fair. You 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 uh, you you led me down that path. I, I I can't possibly be a broadcaster and not ask you that question. Okay, I'll ask you this though: Are you and Daniel friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the the Twitter yeah. the Twitter stuff that's all going on. I know there were some people in the comments that were like, "Okay, you guys are friends. Why don't you guys just, you know, why are you guys doing this over Twitter? Is it a marketing ploy? Are you trying to big up this, you know, the high stakes duel uh, that, that's going on at the end of March? Is that what this is all about?" Let me ask you this, Buckman. Anything? You've been in the poker world for a long time. How many people? How many male people? Do you think? Have do you know that are really close friends with Daniel? Be honest. I'm trying to think. Um, that I know are really close with Daniel. Uh, I mean, really I, close with him as friends. I mean, it's it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tough question for me because I'm not. I mean, I'm not that. I'm not really. You know I'm one. not really close with Daniel. It's, um, it took you a full minute, and you haven't even thought of one Well, but yet, keep, in, right? keep in mind, I'm not that close to Daniel. I was not invited to his wedding, as you were and many others were. So I'm not that close with Daniel. I mean, Daniel, I, I play chess with the guy. You know, I know that. We talk but hockey. If you but ask, uh, but if, you, if, you, if I ask you who are, my, who are my friends, you'd name three people instantly, right? Who yeah. is still close to? You could name three or four instantly. If I ask you who, who's close to Jason Kuhn, you could name three or four instantly. And so, you know, so I asked you a question. How many people do you know that are really close to Daniel, really good friends with him? I, I think, uh, okay, how about Joe Stapleton? He's friends with him. Stapes is friends with him. There's one. Okay. Um, seems like Jeff Platt is saying, Jeff, Jeff, Daniel, Jeff Platt's Daniel, good friends with Daniel him. Keeps, Daniel keeps, up to him, keeps to himself a lot. You know, that's all. Okay. I mean, that's all I'm saying. Right, right. He's very, you know, Amanda's amazing. But he's happy, you know. He is. He and is, I and, and I think, I, I, I mean, I think obviously, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, he's happy. He's in love. He's married. He, he's got. He's got as yeah. much. He's got the money. He doesn't need anything. And 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 in, in many ways, that's emboldened him to kind of be like, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to say what I want to say. I just, which is why I was wondering if you and he are are friends when this is all said and done. You know, can you, you know, sit back and, and have a drink with him and just kind of laugh about it all. Uh, yeah, of course we'll be able to do that. I mean, listen, you, you, you have, you probably have friends that you probably have friends that you know, are completely underestimate. A, a There's so many people out there that completely ester, underestimate people in life. It's just yes. a normal, natural thing, right? Whether they're haters, whether they're, you might have friends that tell you that you know that LeBron James is bad or that Michael Jordan's bad, right? And you'll be like, whoa, you know. And so, you know, I mean, Daniel. He legitimately believes this. And so, you know, when I when I just keep putting up all these numbers, 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 and, you know, and, and some people that are close to both of us are saying, wow, he really believes this. He really believes you're not very good at poker. I'm like, wait, I just finished second and third. The last eight tournaments that, that the World Series of Poker in the real world, I had a second and a third and eight game mix, you know, and you go back like the last in the last 15 tournaments in the real world of the series. I had a, uh, I made a final table in No Limit Hold'em and a Turbo, and then I finished second and third in the eight-game mix over in Europe. So, I mean, just those last 15 tournaments, I have the best record by far of anybody. And so, you know, and so to, to not understand that someone is even good at poker uh, with that, with what I've done is, is a little, you know, I think it's a little delusional, you know, and that, that's okay, but he honestly believes it. He's not He's not saying this and acting this way and doing this stuff just to create a story. He's not doing it just to be a, a jerk. He's doing it, you know, uh, because he believes it. And so then it becomes a little puzzling to some of us that are closer to him, you know? You brought up mixed games, and I have a question for you. So I remember when I first when I first got in the poker world, and as you pointed out, it's been a long time ago. Uh, I'm old, everybody. But no, uh, the... the I remember when you first, when I when I first came in, you were the hold'em guy, right? I mean, all of your bracelets were in no limit hold'em or limit hold'em, and I think there was a perception that you couldn't play mixed games. Then there was a perception for sure, yeah. right? And right. then you know, over the last over the last you know ten fifteen years, you have kind of you know you've dispelled that 
that, and you've been able to, you know, obviously when it comes to Raz tournaments, it seems like you're as good as anybody right now. The results certainly speak to that. Uh, you know, you spoke about, you know, you talked about 2011 uh, when you, uh, you know, you, you, you did well in the uh, in the 50K Players Championship. And you've obviously, you know, you've done really well in mixed events since. Is that been something that you've really focused on? Or do you think it's just, you know, sample size, it, you finally, the cream finally rises to the top? I'll what never was that? forget, I'll never forget that David Gray told me that, uh, David Gray, you know, he can be a little cocky, and, and you know who he is, but a lot mm-hmm. of people don't know who he is. And he basically told me I had no chance in any points contest ever, you know, uh, because I sucked at all the mixed games. That's what he said. And, you know, and, and if you look, Daniel's had his league, his $25,000 league, how many years? Ten years? And if you look at who has the most points on that list of the tournaments that they call super important at the series, I have the most points. And maybe it, maybe I'm in second now. Maybe somebody passed me. But I think I have the most points on that list over 10 years. That says so much. It's Daniel's own league. And yet still he does some. I mean, this is the most delusional stuff ever. So all the great players throughout the last 10 years, all the most important events that they've decided are important, that Daniel's decided important, I have the most points. And yet for some reason... Not it doesn't even consider me in the conversation of greatest of all time. It's just fucking weird, bro. So when it comes to mixed games, was there a concerted effort on your part to get better? Did you study at it? I mean, I'll go even further than that. I think one of the perceptions, one of the reasons why there are people out there that don't respect your your achievements and don't think you're good is I, I think there's this perception that you don't work at the game, you don't study at the game, that you just use quote unquote white magic. Do you study? Do you study? <laughs> Do you work ridiculous. on your game? Of course. Do you, you know, the funny thing is, if you could hear the, if, if, if I could give you the conversations that I had over five years or 10 years with, the, with, uh, with Brandon Cantu and Mike Matisau, all right, and the number of trips we'd make together where we're playing mixed games and all we talk about is how do you play this hand? How do you, I'm texting them all the time, hands, right? And then to hear people say that I'm not studying is fucking insane. It's ridiculous. I think Daniel started that perception too. Oh, Phil doesn't study. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. You can't you can't be great. You can't get better and better and better at games without putting in the effort, you know? I think I'm the best I've ever been at Omaha eight or better, you know, and stud eight or better. Why? Because of Mike the Mouth Madison, who's great at those games, you know? He's the best he's ever been at Hold'em. You know, why? Because he has me as a resource. And so, you know, I mean, I've had, you know, amazing. So we spend a lot of time in study groups. I don't read books. I don't go to websites. I don't look at that stuff. I talk to the best players in the world. You know, I remember I went to who I thought was the best player in the world to ask him about a hand when it came to, uh, when it came to triple draw, you know, and, uh, and, you know, one of the guys that plays, you know, two and 4,000 every day, you know, who I respected. And he was like, so happy I asked him a question, <laughs> you know, that he said, oh, I don't think you should, you know, he gave me his opinion and asked him about another hand. And so, you know, at the, there's in these very subtle, important hands that you play, you, you know, I have access to the best players in the world. These guys have come up to me hundreds of times and asked me about how to play hold'em hands. And, uh, you know, I haven't been able to help much only because a lot of times with the way I'm playing has everything to do with you know, the read in the moment. So I'll be like, okay, I would play it like this, but if I read this guy as that. And so, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, but for I've sure. But I've worked very hard on my game. You know, what do you think What do you think is happening when Mike Madison and I are down in in L.A., you know, two years ago playing the, the half Omaha and the half stud eight or better, half Omaha eight or better, and we get heads up in a, in a field of 50 players. You know, we're talking about hands for days. And so... You know, I mean, because I want to be great at all the games, you know, and all of a sudden I find that I have the best record in history in Raz after never doing anything. In the last 10 years, I have the best record at the World Series of Poker in Raz. Something clicked. Something made sense to me. What? Something that not anybody else saw. What, does it matter what? Yeah. That's well, what yeah, I, I mean, it, uh, well, I'm, uh, why not? Are you, are, you, are you concerned that you're going to give me away your secret and then I'm going to be able to beat you? No, of course you're not. I mean, what, what was it? What was the epiphany? You know, what, made, what went from... I mean, Phil Helmuth's not a Raz player to every single tournament. 
you're suddenly, you know, you're winning Raz events. I remember covering covering the World Series. I'm in the Amazon room and I'm covering a no limit event and they're telling me that, yeah, we're going to cope from this and then we're going to go straight to the Raz tournament because Phil is about to win another bracelet. And I'm like, what? Phil plays Raz now? When did that happen? You know? Well, I have a first, a first, a second, a sixth, and a 14th in Raz tournaments. And these fields are usually really, really deep, four or 500 players. Uh, and then even the 10Ks have 150. So something clicked in Raz for me. I can't exactly tell you what it is, but I know this. You know, reads are super important in Raz, right? And if if a guy if a guy starts with a three up and he raises and he hits a four, right? And you know he's paired. That's ginormous. And if you know he's paired, you can play the the hand completely differently. You know, I played an unorthodox hand in the last Raz tournament, the series I played in where, you know, some guy just knew he paired, and I went crazy and put all the pressure on him. And he hit some miracle runner-runner to bust me. And he knew he was dead, and I knew he was dead, you know, and probably half the table wasn't paying attention. And uh, he hit some mir- – but he had to flip his cards up on 6th Street. And I'm like, yeah, I knew you had that, you know. But he hit some miracle miracle to, to bust me. Now, you know, no one knows his hand. There were 150 players left, and no one cares. But that exemplified – you know, perfectly, you know, that I just knew this guy had paired his card. And because of that, I popped him on fifth street instead of folded on fifth street, you know? Um, and so, you know, and made him get all of his money in, in a bad spot, you know? And, uh, you know, I remember, uh, David Baker, you know, started with a bad one against me when I had four to a six and he had like the ACE three, three, eight, and, uh, you know, and, and I kept popping him because it looked like he had a good board. Or I, I guess I had four to the ten, but there's things you can do in Raz if you know your opponent's weak, you know. And is that, and, ju- is that uh, just a live read thing? I mean, is that just something that's innate? You can't really teach live it? Live just... read, and, you know, I mean, but, but I figured some other stuff out, too. There, there, something, all of a sudden, the game was just like, wow, this is like, it's like playing a piano. All of a sudden, there wasn't a bunch of chopsticks. The game just made sense. Just... And, uh, and I was just like, this is amazing, you know. Um, but it, you know, and so I'm waiting for that epiphany. I've been playing a lot of pot limit Omaha. I won 37 plays in a row online. I saw John Robert a couple of nights ago, and he's like, that's impossible. And I said, no, I know it is. But 37 plays in a row at PLO, I can't wait to play some PLO tournaments because as the light goes on in different games, you know, I'm thinking to myself, why can't I be the greatest of all time in two or three games? You know, I certainly have the record in limit hold'em and no limit hold'em at the series and pot limit hold'em. And I haven't Raz, the best record. So why not get there in two or three other games? Just win three bracelets in, in, in Omaha eight or better, or three bracelets in stud eight or better, or three bracelets in stud, or three ba- bracelets in Tottenham and Omaha, and then become the greatest of all time in that game. Why not? You know? So, yeah, I think that way. And, and luckily, I have access to the best players in the world, you know, who will answer all my questions. Most of them owe me, you know, <laughs> from asking me questions in the past, right? And a lot of them are just honored that I asked, right? And so, yeah, you have to be constantly improving your game, you know? Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, you, you brought up, obviously, anybody that knows you and knows your game, knows how much you rely on live reads and, and the feel at the table. This year, has it been a challenge for you, you know, playing online? The fact that, you know... I've won, be- like, in the last year, I think I won two million. You know, uh, at least, a, a, let me see how much I'm wine. Da, 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 da. Let's see, 800 a million, 1.2, 1.5. I'm up like 1.6 million playing online poker in a year, right? And it's just been crazy. Pot limit Omaha and no limit hold them. I just keep winning and winning. My live reads translate well online. I didn't know this before. I wasn't the player that I was in 2009 and 2010. You know, I just got used to winning all the time and all these televised cash games. I got used to winning all the time in the mixed games. You know, they said, oh, Phil's a bad mixed game player. That's what you heard in 2009. If you ask Mike Mattis, who's played 30 mixed games with me, 30 times we played the same mixed game together in the last, you know, seven years, if he's ever seen me lose, he'll say, no, he hasn't even seen me lose in a mixed game, which I understand I was supposed to, no matter how good you are, I was supposed to take a loss or two. But I've just been that hot at everything. And, you know, I mean, I was telling Mike the other day, I said, hey, is poker this easy? I mean, I just keep stacking up hundreds of thousands of dollars everywhere I go for like five, six years. And then we both just stopped cold. 
And I was like, did I just say that? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, fuck. Because the minute that you start thinking it's easy, you're screwed. And then that night I had a big loss. <laughs> I was going to ask you, do you get, yeah. I mean, there have been because, times in your career where it has been easy. There have absolutely been times in your career where the game has been so easy to you and it's come to you so easily. It, it, there's there's got to be a risk of complacency, right? I mean, there's got to be a point in your career where I mean, which is why it's I'll say it's absolutely impossible to stay on top to stay on top of the mountain for 25, 30 years straight. I mean, there's going to be ups and why downs. Is why is that impossible? I, I would just imagine the complacency. I would imagine okay, so you, like you said, you run, especially in a game like you know in a game like poker where there is so much luck involved as well. But it's just uh, like you said, you know, you, you, the, the game's easy for you. You run hot from two thousand and nine to two thousand and thirteen. Uh, then you know you, maybe you just you, maybe you think you you know it all, so you stop studying for a little bit. People catch up. I don't know. No. You see the thing. Well, let me say, let me just say this, please. For me personally. Go ahead. What you want to say? No, I said please go. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, when it comes to when it comes to know them and hold them, I have a style which apparently a lot of people don't understand. That's frustrating for me, right? I play more read based poker than anybody on the planet because I know that I read well, and and you know, I mean, I think I think I have the best record in no limit hold them. In the tournaments that I play in, whether it's high rollers, which maybe only played twenty or thirty, but I still crushed it. I don't have the best record in high rollers. I'm not. I haven't because I because I haven't. I felt like there were some times where I should have won some high rollers and just was really unlucky. You know, you look at the final table with Antonio, and uh, you know they had a stat on ESPN number of premium hands, and I had zero, and Antonio had like twelve. You know, they were keeping track, and uh, you know everybody else had a bunch, and still I made it all the way to fourth place. And so, you know, there's some times where I feel like, you know, where I feel like I was supposed to do better in some high rollers. Then I just figured I'd get there later in them, you know. Um, but, you know, when it comes to staying at the top, uh, the, 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 the problem isn't knowledge or studying. You know, the problem is that you get cocky and then ego. And ego leads to thinking that you're some laziness, but not necessarily around studying. But, you know, when you start thinking you're great, then you're not paying attention. I mean, I call it, uh, it's very simple. I talk about this in my books. When your head is raised and you're looking at all the people that compliment you, I have people come up to me 10 times a day in Las Vegas, you know, at least on every single day, pictures, autographs, they tell me I'm great. If I let those compliments sink, I'm screwed, you know, because it's not about, whether or not you're great. It's about how you play the next time you play. That's all it's about. And, uh, you know, and so, and so I've been really good at keeping my head down. I, I let my head run away with me a lot. You know, 2014, I was probably too cocky. 2015, you know. Hon, I'm doing a live interview. <laughs> you caught my wife in there. Totally fine. I, I, um, hey, listen, we all love your wife. Hon, you still have your party, right, hon? You still have your party, right? Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so to me, uh, being great at poker is about keeping your head down, you know? And the minute that I said that to Mike, we both just started laughing, you know, uh, where I'm like, is poker, I was saying poker is just too easy, you know? What do you and think I about, mean, what like, do you, I was going to ask you, what do you think about solvers? You know, we talked about playing online and stuff like that and, and being too easy. You know, what, do you use them? Is that is that something you use as a tool? I've or never no? used a solver in my life. What do you think about them? I've never used I've never used a solver in my life. Well, I mean, how would I know about them? I don't know anything about them. Okay, fair enough. That's uh, I, I wasn't sure. What do you think about the the players out there Let me ask that you this. specialize? Do you know anything about solvers? I mean, I, I I've used them a little bit. I study with them a little bit. Okay, did they so do they teach people to play the same hand the same way every time? No. No? So if you input five, six of diamonds and a flop and a turn and a river, it doesn't give you the same answer every time? Well, it'll give you a it, – it, it could give you a percentage of – and I'm not, I'm not an expert in this regard at all, to be honest. But it'll, it'll give you a 
uh, a certain amount of time you should be raising with this particular hand, a certain amount of time, and then somebody, I guess they'll use Correct. the randomizer or so whatever. The point, is this. the point is this. If you enter the same hand, it's going to give you the same exact percentages of what you should do every time, right? Yeah, I guess in theory, yes. So that's really – so. So anything that teaches people how to play poker without reads is missing a huge thing. It's very unpopular for me to say that to the kids, you know, because they're like, they don't understand reads, but you've seen it a hundred times with Daniel or I on television where we make folds that no one else would make, where we make raises or calls that no one else would make because we have a great read on somebody. Right. Yeah. And you can see that we're, you can see that we have a great read. You can see that we know that that person's weak. You can see that we know that that person is strong. And then, you know, and then, and then, you know, when it comes down to a great read, uh, you know, and so if a solver doesn't account for reads, then I would think that it's not the be all end all, but I think that it's probably really good for people to see that, Hey, when you're in the middle of this hand in the spot, there's options about how to play it because it's educational. Right. And so the solver is saying, Hey, you should raise this percentage of time. You should call this percentage of time. Right. And, uh, and, you know, and so then that's educational because now people can start thinking, Hey, this is, I should be doing this more or that more. Right. And you're thinking about the game, but you know, you still reading ability is a huge thing. And if you want to be one of the greatest in the world, the greatest of all time, you have to have reads. Okay. I'll ask you a couple more questions. Then I'll let you go. I know your wife's finishing our party, but for people out there who are spying, po- aspiring poker players, the people that are putting the work in and they're, you know, they, 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 they're, they're working the technical aspects of the game. Maybe they're using the solvers, but they want, you know, maybe they want a little glimpse of what you have. They want that ability to be able to sit at the table and read their opponents. What advice do you have for them? I mean, how do they get just even a small slice of what you have? I mean, I've tried coaching literally... Uh, yeah, I'd say I've tried 10 different people that I really, really try to teach them reads. And I feel like there's a book called EQ by Daniel Goleman. He talks about learnable star qualities, but reading ability is not a learnable star quality. Either you have it or you don't. And so, you know, on the other hand, I think that some of the programs that, that, that this generation's come up with to improve their games are phenomenal and really, really good. So I'm not saying you know, I'm not saying that they're not going to be super competitive. What I'm saying is, you know, they still have to sit across. If they're with people that can read them, then it's less powerful. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I can buy that. Let's let's turn our attention really quickly. I mean, I could talk to you for hours and hours, and I, I'll get you back on at some point. But let's talk about the high stakes duel. Uh, you know, first off, obviously, you played Antonio, and, and I'm not going to lie. You know, going back to, man, I don't even want to say how many years ago it was, but when Antonio Esfandiari kind of made a splash on the scene at the WPT final table where he did that wave and he was up against you and he was playing so aggressive against you and you could see how much it was, you know, he he made his name there against you because of what he was doing against you. And then to see so many years later, obviously, him being a big name in poker and you guys face up, and then the fact that you kicked his ass three times, it was just fantastic. And I love Antonio. I, I consider him a good friend, but it was so much fun to watch that. Uh, talk about that for a moment, and then well, obviously we'll turn our attention also, to Daniel. He's also, he's also, since 2010 or something, uh, I, I, I had him come with me to do an event for a taser in Arizona, the taser company. And so ever since then, he's been saying, I want to, I'll play your heads up, and the loser gets shot with the taser. He challenges me all, every time we're together on the cameras. He <laughs> challenges me, challenges me, challenges me. I said, I'm not afraid of you. We can go play heads up, but I'll play you for 10K or 20K, and we'll go to RA or whatever, and we'll just play. And so he knew that I'd play him. And then, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, he, you know, he came into that match, and he said, oh, I think I'm 60, 65% favored over Phil. What did he think? I wasn't going to be able to pull the trigger on a huge bluff. What did he think? I wasn't going to be able to make a great call. What did he think? I, I, you know, that I, I didn't have a a strategy that I'd been refining my whole life and at Hold'em at heads up. And so, you know, he, he, that first match was pretty good. And then the second match they came in and I said, what are you? And he said, well, I don't know, maybe 55% favorite. And the second match is where I really kind of smashed him. You know, and the second match was, was really, 
I felt like that was where I kind of dominated a little bit, you know, I'd say. And then, uh, and then the third match they came in and he said, well, I don't know, 50%. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, do these players, does he know I've won 17 out of my last 19 matches against world-class players, including jungle man and Doug Polk, who they say are number one or two in the world, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and then that third match was a really, really good match, you know? And, uh, and that last hand, you'll have to go back and watch it. You know, I, I, that was a, you know, I felt like I kind of set him up for that last hand and, you know, and put in a lot of money there and, uh, you know, and luckily my hand held up. And so I was really kind of proud of the way I played and, you know, and then I think that led Phil Gelf on to say, wow, you know, I've been underestimating Helm youth. Uh, maybe he is a great player, which was kind of, which was kind of, I was, which I, I was happy he said it, but I was like, whoa. Didn't they watch the 2012 WSOPE final table? Haven't they watched all the stuff I've done? But most people don't sit there and watch another player, right? So, you know, but I felt like if history, if somehow there could be a camera on all these no limit hold-up tournaments that I've won and all these moves I've made and all these calls I've made, you know, and I could do a highlight reel of like four hours of, of my best or 10 hours of my best play, that everybody would say, wow, you know? We don't have that stuff. We only have final tables, you know. I, I think but even it, at final tables, I've been at. I, I think know? it's. I, so I think it's hard for people. Out. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I th- comes out and compliments me. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this whole the whole younger generation goes crazy, like, "Oh, Phil doesn't. Phil sucks." And so, right in front of their eyes, I I won three matches against Antonio, and uh, you know, and it's just, but people don't really keep track of stuff. I mean. You know, they don't know what I've done. I have to repeat my own stats sometimes, and then that becomes something I don't want to do all the time, you know? Why should I have to defend myself, you know? Why should I tell people? I mean, the granny says I'm a loser at high rollers. He's wrong. I'm up at least a million. I think it's 1.5. Even he admits it, but, but he posted that, that I wasn't. And then, you know, but did he correct that? No, of course not. He's like a politician, you know? You know, a lie gets caught lying and never even corrects it. I think it's it's very easy for people to criticize what they don't understand. Uh, I always go back to hockey because I'm a hockey guy, and you know my uh, our listeners know that about me. But there are stories written about Wayne Gretzky when he was 14, 15 years old, and he was dominating kids that were 17 and 18 years old. And scouts would go and watch, and they'd all dismiss this young, scrawny kid because they were like, what's he doing? He's just, just go after him. Why are they giving him so much space? And nobody understood. They just didn't see it. And, you know, I'm not comparing you to Wayne Gretzky, but at the same time, I do think there is something, I think there is something when people don't understand what makes you successful, when they can't pinpoint it, when they can't be like, well, he does A, B, and C really well. When they can't pinpoint it, they're very quick to dismiss it, especially in a game like poker where there is luck. They'll just go, oh, he's just gotten lucky. But it's kind of ridiculous. And my words on Twitter were, it's utterly ridiculous to suggest that you're bad. Uh, the records, Your record speaks for itself. There's, there's no way over this large a sample size that you just continue to run hot. Okay, let's continue on, though. Uh, the Daniel Negreanu match, which is coming up. Negreanu, by the way, last I checked, is a minus 250 favorite. Before I continue, what are the actual uh, – how is this – is this match going to be the exact same match as Antonio? Everything is live in the PokerGo studios, nothing online? Same exact format where, you know, now I've won whatever it is, 20 out of 22 because I beat Antonio three times. So, you know, so one of my friends is like, he must know – and Matt, Mike Mattisau said the same, but another friend said, hey, he must know you're the greatest poker tournament player of all time. It's not even close. Even most of the young generation will admit that. And so what's he doing? And then somebody's like, I think he's trying to get an edge on you and heads up. And I thought to myself, that's the worst thing he could have done. By ripping my ego down, I'm going to be more focused than ever. You know? I mean, I'm going to be more focused than ever. I mean, you know, if he would have said, if he would have come in with Phil's greatest of all time, blah, 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 blah then maybe, maybe he gets me a little too cocky, you know? But no, he came in tearing me down. So I don't think that was his best play, I, but, but that might have been what he's trying to do. I don't know. 
What do you think? Are you going to watch the match he had? I mean, he's got, you know, obviously 25,000 hands no. against the, You're not going to watch no. any of it? No. How are you going to prepare for this heads-up match? Uh, I'm going to be – what I've been doing is I've been thinking about exactly what I'm going – I can't talk to anybody on the planet about Hold'em heads-up. There's no one I can talk to. There's not one person. Who am I supposed to talk to? You know what I mean? Like, you know – uh, some people are like, well, you should learn this or you should learn that. But all I do is win my heads up matches. I just keep winning and winning and winning. And so, you know, the only time, the last time I got advice was from like Mike the Mouth Mattis. I when I said, please don't give me advice. And he screamed, yeah, I need to do this. And then I ended up losing that match. So I have my own theory about how to play Hold'em. And I know his theory. You know, I mean, I know exactly what he's going to do. I don't think he's going to vary from it at all. He's going to raise exactly 20% of the buttons. Excuse me. He's going to raise exactly 80% of the buttons. He's going to fold around 18 to 20% of the hands before the flop, you know, and, and, and so I'm expecting that. But if he doesn't do that, I consider myself the best counter puncher, you know? And so, you know, I, whatever strategy he uses in that moment, then it's up to me in that moment to come up with a strategy that counters it. And so none of that help happens in advance. The only thing that I will look at is I'll look at, maybe I'll, I'll look at some reads just to see what he looks like when he's bluffing. So maybe I'll watch some video of him playing live in the last year or two just to see it. But I don't think I'm going to do that, you know, uh, but I think I might do that. So that's 50, 50, whether I do that. I mean, instead I've been thinking about what exactly I want to do and I don't really have anybody that I can talk to, you know, uh, and when it comes to, you know, when it comes to some no limit hold them hands, there's four or five people in the world I could talk to. When it comes to Omaha 8 or better, I'm calling Mike the Mouth Mattiso. When it comes to Stud 8 or better, I'm calling Mike. And so, but, you know, when it comes to Pot Limit Omaha, I could probably use some of Phil Galfon's wisdom or somebody like that, right? And so, you know, so those players I will ask about in their games because they're the best in the world. But, you know, my record and heads up has been crazy. I won the first heads up championship in 05, the NBC heads up. And the, sec the last one, I finished second to Mike, you know. And remember, he called off all the money with a flush draw with one to come in the last match. I do remember it's that. It's a dry flush draw, a top pair. I mean, he put in 357000 and then hit a diamond, you know. And I, 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 and I had played I, the second. I had lost it. During the second match, you played bad. I love how you. I, I love how you. Years and years later, I mean, the amount of poker you played, and you remember the hand. You remember what he did on the turn, how many chips he had. It's fantastic. Yeah. Hey, you're a sports guy. I know you love sports. I know you love betting on sports. Remember when Tiger Woods was just on top of his game, and he was just dominating, and he had a he yep. had a golf coach because even the best in the world yep. have coaches. And I remember, yep, I Carmen, remember listening. Yeah, I remember listening on ESPN and watching Sports Center like we all used to do all the time. And I remember them talking about how Tiger Woods, they were tinkering with his swing. And all I'm thinking in my head, I'm going, what the fuck are they, th why are they tinkering with Tiger Woods' swing? What are you doing? And as you tell me the well, story about how you've won 20 out of 22 matches, and you talk about, you know, who am I supposed to talk to? You know, and then you yell at Mike, 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 Mouth, Mike, Mike the Mouth saying, don't, don't, don't give me advice, no. It kind of makes me think. I'm like, okay, are you thinking the same thing? Why am I tinkering with something? Why am I fixing something if it's not broke? Well, that's exactly right. So I take criticism, you know. It's really funny. I take criticism for not working on my game when it comes to heads up. And it's, it's true. I have not changed anything in my game. I just keep winning and winning and winning. But I also come in with a counter punter strategy. I'm a counter puncher and no limit hold them heads up. Now, when it comes to hold them tournaments in general, occasionally I'll run strategies by somebody or talk to somebody, you know, um, but also I'm, I self adjust there too. So that's why I love the series because I would come in for the first hold of tournament, be playing too fast or too slow based on the current conditions and what everybody else believes at that moment. And then adjust the second day and the third day and the fourth day. And I get better and better as time passes. And so I love that because I'm thinking so much about the game. I'm dreaming about it, thinking about it, working hard at it. And each day I adjust, adjust, adjust. Well, when heads up, I think I found the perfect strategy for me, you know, and, uh, and it, it's a counter puncher thing, you know, and, uh, you know, 
if someone's going to raise every button, then there's something I'm going to do. And if someone's going to limp every button, then there's something I'm going to do. If someone's going to raise 50% of the buttons, then there's something I'm going to do. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not really looking at, you know, I'm paying more attention almost to, you know, what my opponent's doing, you know. I mean, I'm a counterpuncher, you know. Listen, I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass, Phil. But I have told people, and I'll tell people right now, anybody listening to this, right now, like I said, on poker shares, the current odds are Negreanu is minus 250. I don't know what the middle is, but I am happy to bet on Phil Helmuth uh, in, in this format. What would you say, you know, you versus Daniel, you know Daniel well, you know yourself. Uh, what would you set the line at? You're, you're a sports better. When you know 250, you know that you, people are confused when they hear 250. So that's on a $2 bet, right? So... So they make me minus, you know, a minus whatever, a dollar sixty or whatever, is what they say, right? So it's not like they're saying he's two and a half to one favorite. But if you, you know, a lot of people out there don't know how to convert the math right, right? That's that's on a two dollar bet. So you bet two dollars. Uh, is is that on a two dollar bet? No, no. The minus two fifty is just uh, that's that's based on a hundred dollar bet. So you've got to bet two fifty to win a hundred in that. Okay, so I, it actually I'm is. Sure. I, I, so I pro, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen that anywhere. So, I, I, so what I saw was a different number. What it I might it might have come down. I, I mean, the might the numbers might have come down when they when they changed the format or well, made sure the format was live and not online. Well, what I, the numbers that I saw that were actually posted were about a dollar forty. A dollar forty. You know, okay. They have them. That's what I saw. So, um, but you know, a dollar forty, yeah, on a hundred dollar bet is what I saw. So, let me just tell you something. It doesn't matter what I think, and you know, and and if I and if I, uh, I'll just say that I like coming in under the radar. I like coming in under the weather. You know, under the radar, not weather. You know, and so when it comes to this match with Daniel, I don't want to. You know, I'm not going to make any predictions. I'm a counter puncher, but I'll give him credit. You know, I mean, he has he all he's done is study no limit hold'em. You know, uh, I don't. I don't think in the past. I mean, his record in heads-up tournaments. My record in heads-up tournaments. I won one of the last two I played in. You know, I mean that's not easy to do. That was on the East Coast. Look it up. You know, and then uh, and I've won just what, like I say, what is it? Twenty out of twenty-two matches. So I've been very. Things have been very good for me in heads-up. But I know that Negranu has spent time studying with two coaches that I really think are smart. MJ and uh, and who is it? MJ and Matt. I know exactly. Anyway, the coach. Yeah. He 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 he, yeah. he clearly dedicated his game. He dedicated himself to learning more GTO and 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 kind of trying to make his game a little bit more modern, so to so to speak. Yeah, you know, and so and so so you can't underestimate Daniel. He's been thinking about how to play heads up, no limit hold'em. For months, he's been coached by people that I respect, that he respects, that, you know, all the great players should respect if they met them. And so, you know, I mean, he's he's a force. And also, he's a guy that has some reads. Antonio has reads, you know. Um, and Daniel has reads. And so, you know, uh, so, I mean, he's just going to be really, really tough. I love it. Well, hey, listen, I am looking forward to it. Uh, a- a- as a friend, as a fan, I uh, please don't change. I will. I will echo what WPT said to you many, many years ago. Don't change. Uh, just be yourself. Have a great time. You always put on a great show, and uh, that's all we can ask for, man. All right. Thanks a lot, Tuckman. You got it. Have Thank you, day. buddy. Good luck to you, buddy. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Phil Helmuth put a bow on it. I could genuinely talk to Phil for hours upon hours. I feel like you could have like a six-part podcast with Phil Helmuth. When I say talk to, I should probably rephrase that and just say listen to Phil. I was going to ask him about the hand with Doug, but I figure he'd just say, oh, it was a good lay down, whatever. I played it perfectly. Now, I genuinely I have a lot of respect for Phil Helmuth and his game. I really do. And I wasn't lying when I said that the older I get, the more I like him. You know, I remember early on in my career, I, I really thought, I was like, God, what an asshole, right? <laughs> like, if that guy treated my dad like that at the table after my dad made a bad call or something, I'd be so, I'd be so pissed off. 
But I guess as I've gotten older, I've kind of understood it. And now I kind of just I laugh at him. I just I, I genuinely do. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed him. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Under the Gun. I am back once again in two weeks. You can check out my videos over at CrushLivePoker.com. Get one month free using the code DTA501. And thank you so much 